Welcome to Let's Face the Facts, the rewatch podcast for the classic sitcom, The Facts of Life. Join us each week as we synopsize, analyze, criticize, and ultimately idolize the show. And now, here's your host of Let's Face the Facts, the wonderful David Almeida! Welcome back. It's another week, another show. Thank you for downloading and pressing play. Matthew and I are already on the Zoom with our insanely talented, super special guest, Ms. Oh. Heather Delma. You are good at lying. You are an excellent actor, David. Thank oh. you for saying that things about me. <laughs> oh, and you are good at lying too, Heather. Oh, I believed every word of what you just said about David being a good actor. <laughs> oh. Oh. And we are starting early this week, clearly. Heather, this is your second appearance on our show. We have not seen the likes of you since, uh, by my count, April of 2019. What was the episode? Because this was before, this was BM. This was before Matthew. Uh, Yes, Heather was here very, very early in our run, comparatively speaking. She was here for season two, episode 12, called The Secret. And that was in the before times. It was in April of 2019. And that was the one where Joe, who was a very new character at this point, was harboring the secret that her dad was in prison. Heather, what I'm interested in, coming at the show from season nine, when your first episode was, oh my God, season two, for two, God's sake. Like 12 episodes into Joe. We only had Joe for, what, three months or four months. I, I can't do the math, but yeah. What, what kind of, what, what are your thoughts and feelings about this show versus that show that you watched? Well, I definitely feel like Joe takes Blair's jabs with a grain of salt better. Mm-hmm. She's, she's grown a thick skin in her Joe-like way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the girls have developed. They have. Mrs. Garrett looks completely different. <laughs> you wouldn't even recognize her. She must have had some work done. <laughs> and like that. Any anything else? Any other thoughts about uh, how our show has evolved over the last seven seasons? <laughs> well, I thought the kitchen was the set of family ties. It does resemble it a lot, doesn't it? It uh-huh. is very family ties. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um. And we haven't seen this kitchen. This kitchen's a fairly new thing, too. We haven't seen the kitchen uh, very much. Very, very futuristic. Very, like, final room in the carousel of progress. (laughs) (laughs) And you haven't seen over our heads. You didn't even, you haven't gotten to see over our heads because, dear listeners, what episode is this, David? Episode six? This is episode seven. We have yet to see over our heads this season. I'm, I'm tracking the over our heads appearances for season nine. And we haven't seen it yet, Heather. Wait, what do you mean over the heads? Over oh, our heads. The, no, you yeah, that's, that's the store. The Spencer gifts like store. Oh, that yes. they ran oh it's to. not. It's not in yet. Oh, it's in. It's oh. we just haven't seen it yet this season. And oh, okay. clearly nobody fucking works there because they have all their time to do all this other stuff and no scenes take place in the store while anybody is actually working. So, uh, yeah, so we're tracking the fact that it has been weeks and weeks since we have actually been shown the store. Well, there's probably some sort of shipping delay. Yeah, supply chain, just like we're going yeah. through now, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, yes. I used to have one of those inflatable palm trees. Did one. you? Yes. Ah, oh, that's so cool. I'm totes <laughs> jelly. Touch me. <laughs> well, let me get some nuts and bolts out of the way about the episode, and then we can start talking about the specifics. David. Matthew. Can I have your nuts and bolts, please? What? Yes, I, I offer you my nuts and my bolts. Here we go. Thank you. 
This is season nine, episode seven, called The More the Marrier, which had an original air date of November 21st of 1987. It was written by Lawrence H. Levy. This is the second of two episodes that he will write for the series. First one he wrote was Younger Than Springtime, which was the one at the end of last season when Joe's dad, uh, they attempt to fix him up with uh, a friend of Blair's and he ends up dating the daughter. So uh, yeah, he has only 28 credits. That's not a lot. Uh, but there are a lot of one-offs on pretty high-profile and popular series. I recommend, uh, if people want further information, uh, absolutely check out his IMDb. And uh, we do have another anomaly going on here, Heather, is that this episode is directed by Valentine Mayer, who is not their typical in-house director, the one that has directed the most of them. I don't know if Valentine Mayer is a recipient of the Emmy Award, like our own Matthew Arder <gasps> is a recipient of the Emmy Award, which he just happened to show us in the background of his screen. Did you see that? I'm so embarrassed. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I know you hate it when we point out your winning things and all that, Matthew. Nobody, nobody said winning. Yep, that's true. Uh, he, I even said it. He's the recipient of the Emmy Award. So this is the fourth of six episodes that Mr. Mayer would be directing in lieu of John Boab. And uh, yeah, so it's two more coming up this season, but it's it's just a handful. For the most part, John Boab, uh, Heather, is the one who directed the majority of the episodes in the latter half of the series. I'm sure you're familiar with this work, Heather. Naturally. The wonderful. So Heather, this is the time during the show when we like to put our guest on the spot and ask if you could please provide a one to two sentence synopsis of the entire episode that you have watched. If your synopsis is too long, Matthew will judge you. Oh, no pressure. David, I've turned over a new leaf, David. Wait, wait what? Season nine. You, we've, we've got the best of the best on the show now. We had the wonderful Charlize French. We had the wonderful Dominic. <laughs> Sarah and French. Yes. Now we've got now we've got the wonderful Heather Delmont, and she's gonna give you the perfect one to two cent synopsis for TV Guide. What so okay. one to two sentence? Yeah, like like the TV guide entry you might have read back in 1987 when you as all of us were just a fetus, of course. Okay. Go. Two timing tootie takes Blair's advice and she uh gets offered a certain proposal. Brava, that uh, is lovely. Sucked. That sucked. No. <laughs> no, it's no, no. And let me tell you why it was wonderful, Heather, because you said a proposal. And if you're looking at this in the TV guy, the title of the episode would be there. And the title is a play on Marrier. And it's not the more the merrier, M-E-R-R-I-E-R. -R -R -E and it's the more the merrier, M-A-R-R. -R. So you're not giving anything away because the title says that, you know. So. The title gives it away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For all intents and purposes. Okay, kids, are we ready to jump in with our deep dive, heavy duty analysis of this? Yeah. <sighs> I, I will say, um, the, the general thoughts initially about this episode and Heather, we're not going to make any bones about the fact that season nine is rough it is. in the writing. What and happened? Have we just worn everything out and like, there's nowhere for these girls to go? Uh, you, you would think that from the scripts, I would dare to disagree because now that they're all college students and beyond, you know, there was a little show called Friends that ran in the 90s about young adults navigating their way through uh, young adulthood. And, you know, I don't see why this show couldn't have kind of become more of that type of a show. But um, the first line of the episode, though, when Beverly Ann comes in and is dropping off her car keys and taking off her coat, the first line already made me super happy. And mm -hmm. I already was predisposed to uh, be very uh, um, amicable toward this episode because her first uh, line is that was so succinct Beverly Ann <laughs> Jesus 
<laughs> we talk about how how Cloris Leachman is so good at florid, fussy dialogue. And the discovery as we talk about it is it's also a, a habit I am picking up more and more as I watch more and more episodes with her in it. Oh. Last week, Matthew gave me shit because I said, um, uh, because uh, Joe is the only one doubting the veracity of Pippa's story. And he's like, what? <laughs> Uh, is Pippa her daughter or I don't remember Pippa. Pippa oh, is an exchange student that they brought in. Oh, okay. And as you know, she's basically the cousin Oliver of the show. They were like, oh God, Tootie is 19 years old now. So we need a child. We need somebody who's a teen, who's a school age student, because we don't know what the fuck to do with the rest of this show. So they brought in this exchange student from Australia because remember everything in the eighties was all about Australian culture. I mean, I'm sure you don't, you're much too young. Yes. Like Outback Steakhouse. And Crocodile Dundee and Olivia Newton-John and uh, all that stuff. So, uh, so the first words are Pippa. Well, Pippa is on her way to Washington on that field trip that she's away on which means she will not be appearing in this episode. And that made me very, very happy. Because you don't like Pippa? You don't like Australia? Yeah, yeah. Austra that fucking country can suck it. God, I hate Australia. <laughs> There's two things that David hates. Racism and Australians. <laughs> Oh, bless. No, I just hate that they add another character and then they didn't do anything of any interest with her. And now she's just one more extraneous thing that has to be dealt with. We already added Andy uh, a couple seasons ago and only recently has Beverly Ann adopted him before he was just the neighborhood kid floating in and out of the store. Hmm. So we already have a kid. We have a boy. And that means, OK, we got another body that we have to make sure is on stage with lines to say so yeah i'm i'm not a fan of pippa the actress is magnificent her name is sherry austin she's a, a very well-known country singer hmm. and uh but yeah nope not a fan of the pippa so glad she is not in this episode well they should send her to man the store shouldn't they though then you could finally get some sleep at night david I could. I'm like, who's minding this? Yeah, the, the, nobody, no talk of the store. Nobody goes near the store. Who was Matthew was laughing at me. Lubricant and the inflatable palm treats, for God's sakes. <laughs> and the pens that if you turn them upside down, the guy drops his pants and you see the schlong. <laughs> yeah, I said schlong. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was, that was beautiful. You're welcome. <laughs> The only thing I have to say about this whole first scene is, and I hate to say it, the fashion made me want to walk directly into the ocean. <laughs> no. Okay, expound on the fashion. There is a lot of fashion going on in this episode, Bla for sure. Blair looks like she's on an episode of Sister Wives, for God's sake. <laughs> Yeah, she does. She's well, in this gray, like she's a postulant nun or something. Yeah. Um, she's wearing the dress I think Julie Andrews wore in the first scene of, of Sound of Music. <laughs> the poor didn't want this one, Captain. And Tootie in her mom jeans. Ooh. They were, the waistband was so high it had deodorant stains on it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the fashion. High-waisted jeans were the big thing. Here's a 17-inch zipper. You're going to have to work your way through, Jeff. <laughs> uh, everyone looked like the letter T. You had shoulder pads out. And then, yeah, the jeans came all the way up to right under the boobs, pretty much. They were yeah. so high. And dynasty yeah. hair. And dynasty hair, man. Yep. What else, and, uh, what else and, going, and, is going on? And Joe's hair looks like like it looked good in person, maybe, but the way the light was coming through the sides, <laughs> like there were there were clumps of like <laughs> in in her C. You know what I mean? When they pull your hair back, hairspray it so your hair makes like a C. Yeah, outward. yeah, yeah. Like it it looked like in person 
they were probably okay. But when the light was behind her, the way she was being filmed, it was like, oh, here's a big clump. And then there's like an inch and a half of no hair. And I don't know. It just, I, I noticed I, I would have maybe run a pick through it once <laughs> or twice. Yeah. Or, or lit it more from the front. Because all three yeah, of us yeah. know you can style a wig and then you go check a different mirror. And if you're backlit, you're like, oh, what the fuck is that? And you're like, okay, it yeah. looks it looks good in normal stage lighting. But uh, yeah, yeah, that was a that was a thing. Um, do we want to talk about this B story of Natalie tracking Snake on his journey? Do we want to kind of get this out of the way? I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm good. I'm kidding. <laughs> But David, this is a monumental episode for that reason. Oh, yeah. No, no. This is a big deal. Heather, this is a big deal. We've been hearing about Snake forever. Oh, you've never met him before? Blair has even doubted the veracity of the existence of Snake. Like like he's a Matthew's just thrown his arms up at me. It, One doesn't denounce the veracity just, of Jesus H. Shakespeare. <laughs> so you're saying that Blair uh, thinks that Snake is the George Glass of the facts of life? Yeah. He wrecked. Thank yep, you. exactly. She thought Snake was a fake. And no. uh, yeah, and uh, we we do need to point out that there have been times when they were allegedly supposed to be in the same place. Like the thing that the girls were going to when Blair was doubting that Snake really existed, uh, it was like he showed up and Natalie turns to the camera and broke the fourth wall and says, uh, you're just going to have to take my word on this one and walks out. So uh, they've been teasing us with wow. who is this snake for some time. But it's like technically they were going to the same place like she was going to get there with Snake and be like in your face, Blair, suck it, bitch. He fucking exists. So we we assume that that didn't happen, at least not verbatim. Hmm. And uh, so anyhow, ignoring that, yes, Matthew, I agree with you. This is monumental because we are finally getting to meet Snake in person. He has never appeared on the show. He's only been talked about. Like he's he's like been the Alan Brady or the Maris Crane of this series at this point. It was like seeing Carlton the doorman, for God's sake. Yeah. (laughs) But are we going to talk about that right now just to get it out of the way? Because I, I, the buildup that we have had for Snake, Mm -hmm. and he shows up as this dude. (laughs) And I had a feeling in my tum tum, David, I did, about that reminded me of when Geraldo opened Al Capone's vault. (laughs) (laughs) And and you just, you're like, fuck, that, that's it? Yeah. Uh, And uh, and then I sat in the corner and I I put on a record and I sang, is that all there is by the wonderful, my aunt Peggy Lee. Oh. (laughs) Um, yeah, well, let's talk about, let's, let's build up, let's do our own build up to the revelation of Snake. Uh, he is on the road. He's driving a truck, apparently. And Natalie has decided that because this winter carnival happening at Langley is apparently more important than the coronation of the fucking queen, that she needs to track him on a map that is the size of their piano. Do I lie, children? No, I saw it. This is a map that she, it is like three foot by five foot. She has a map with a little magnetic truck on it where she's gonna track where he is leading up to his arrival because he's coming and he's taking her to this very, very, very important winter carnival. So, with that, the I, I I can't take my eyes off of this ridiculous map and why writers thought this would be anything relating to something common sense or realistic. It's it, uh, re- really this was huh. well, and I would like to know on that storyline as well, even in the. 80s without cell phones i'm not real sure it was a thing 
to call a truck stop and be like, hey, snake there. Yeah, come on. <laughs> and have them be like, he's a regular. Bitch, we work at a truck stop. Yeah. And she says, you oh, think- you do have, she says, how many snakes do you have? And she goes, oh, that many? It's like, uh, yeah. Well, and how many regulars do you think we have, for Christ's sake? They're all truckers. They're all regulars. They all mm-hmm. drew the same route most of the time. So <laughs> I don't even think that was a thing. And then leave a message. Fuck you. This is a truck stop serving food. I ain't his fucking answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> Click. Every one of those conversations should have ended with her going, hello, hello. Yep. Yeah. Oh, she didn't have to tell me to shove it up my ass. You yeah. know what I mean? And, <laughs> she did just, hang up on Joe. Joe did get hung up on when she tried to intervene. And it's like, good. Yes. But just, that just made me laugh. But yeah. she's like calling Al's truck stop on I-80 outside yeah. of outside of Mishawaka. Yeah. No, I it's, mean, it is, it is ridiculous. Number? Right. Well, she clearly got went down to the library and got the Phoenix telephone book. I mean, who the fuck? She knows? pulled it up on the microfiche machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the other thing about this storyline. Uh, Snake is a regular. Yeah, regular, you know, because he drives a truck a lot. We have never been told that Snake drives a truck. In fact, at one point when Natalie is upset that storms and weather conditions are going to delay him to the point that he can't come and take her to this thing, she says, oh, I told him he shouldn't have been a trucker. He should have never given up on his dream to lay hot tar. When we first heard about Snake, he was the guy who laid the hot tar on the road crew where Natalie was working when Natalie was just taking random jobs to try and figure out what she wanted to do post high school, pre-college. So Snake already is a hot tar guy. Post high school, pre-college, Heather. I know, how many jobs did she have? Don't trust the veracity of his statement. (laughs) It wasn't after high school and before college. It was post high school. We, I've got to have something that brings me joy, David. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's my inner Phyllis Lindstrom, man. Hearing you over talk is, is my new favorite thing to listen for. It's so nice to not have, you know, annoying ticks and things that, that people do that they think are funny that actually aren't. But sometimes, you know, I don't, I don't want anybody. I don't, I, I'm just so glad I don't have any of those. <laughs> well, I think I, everyone who listens to this podcast, Matthew, agrees with you. <laughs> See, thank you, Heather. This is one of the many reasons I love you. <sighs> I got you. So, but anyways, <laughs> snakes career aside, yeah, and the ridiculousness of Natalie tracking him, the ridiculousness of this story, the ridiculousness of let's also let's take this awful, bizarre nonsensical story and let's add a, a life-size map of the United States. It's, it's don't have practically one? life-size. You don't have one in your house? <laughs> I know. Isn't that so funny? I don't have a three-foot by five-foot wall-sized map of the United States. That is magnetic. We have a little magnet track. <laughs> <laughs> But then when we do uh, come out, all the girls are like, oh, my God, he's here. They all come out into the living room from the kitchen and they are met with what we all have imagined Snake to be based upon what Natalie has described him to be. Why wasn't that dude Snake? Yes, he would have been great. (laughs) And of course, it's the wonderful Donald Gibb playing the role of Wendell when he reveals that he is actually Snake's driving partner. And he's, no, that's not me. I I just ride with him. Uh, Donald Gibb, 98 credits in a 31-year career. Oh, God, I thought you were going to say 98 years old. (laughs) (laughs) No. Uh, Last thing on his IMDb list of credits was in 2011, and that was some voice work. He is six foot four, and he will be, of course, best loved and remembered for the 1984 film Revenge of the Nerds, in which he played Ogre. Oh. And he was in all of the sequels, and he is the one that coined the phrase, Nerds! 
I thought when he first came out, he might be like a pro wrestler. Uh, he probably could have been. Yeah. He might have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh oh. I want to know what his life was like as an actor, because he plays in every movie, he's that guy. And it, it's one of those things where I'm like, Francis Bavier felt like she was typecast as Aunt B and hated the Andy Griffith show. Oh, yeah. But was well, this dude like, fuck, I'll show up and growl for 500 for, for base pay? You know what I mean? Like, was, was well, he happy with his career? Or was he like, I just want them to cast me as the romantic lead in something. <laughs> And let them sh let let yeah. them sh let me show what I can do, you yeah. know. They haven't seen my Mercutio yet. So, yeah, he um, wants to play Othello for Christ's sake, and they've got him always the big ape in the room. If you look at his IMDb, Matthew, I've wrote I've written down a few of the names of the roles he's played. I would love to hear them, including Mad Dog, <laughs> yes, Moto Face, Big Luther, Ripper, and of course. Skull Crusher. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm with you. It's like, did he enjoy this or was he like, well, fuck, I got another month of rent's going to be due. And it's it's a good rate. It's, you know, better than a regular day rate. He's also almost 80. No. Oh. 54. Wait. What? I'm 54. No. Suck a dick. No. <laughs> He what? Was, he was born in 54, you old queen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were like, he's 54 years old, so he's practically 80. No, he's like, what, 69? <laughs> closer to 80 than that. But anyway. Uh, um, closer to 80 than he is to 54. But I just, I, I like him a lot. And I just was wondering that as I watched his, his scene. So that's what we have when when Wendell reveals that, no, I'm not Snake. I'm just his driving partner. Then Natalie comes in the door with Snake, and it is Robert Romanus. Fresh from Ridgemont High. I swear. Yeah. Th apparently the times have slowed down a little bit, and he's doing sitcoms. So that movie career never quite took off after. Robert Romanus is currently 66 years old, still working. He has 75 credits in a 42-year career. He's worked as recently as 2016. Jesus, and he's almost 80. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, he was on 50 episodes of Days of Our Lives. He did 10 episodes of Fame, many one-off appearances on 21 Jump Street, CSI, Will and Grace, Cougar Town. I mean, he's he's you know, stayed out there doing high profile projects. But yeah, his most indelible role is Mike Damone in 1982's Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And Heather, I have gone on record saying this multiple times before. I do not find him in any way fuckable at all. I didn't think so in Fast Times. Uh, they, they try to brand him as like this Italian stallion, this, uh, this cool guy where it's a get to to get to sleep with him and i'm just like uh huh really yeah what what are your thoughts as a, as a woman of of heterosexual tendencies oh who me yeah <laughs> um no he doesn't really do it for me either uh yeah and i mean you've seen fast times did you how did you feel about him when you saw him in that i thought he was a big old dick yeah thank you cuz he is yeah. he's an asshole in the um, movie yeah, he has like this smooth talking way, but it doesn't quite go with his appearance, I feel like. It's a little disjointed for me. Okay, thank you for asking my opinion. He was poorly <laughs> written was the problem. They needed to write him like a Ralph Macchio or a Michael J. Fox, where you do want him a baby, if you will, in in Dirty Dancing, where are they not classically attractive? Well, don't make him a dick that's like the Italian stallion. Make him the dork who doesn't know how attractive he is. And he's just a cool guy, like Michael J. Fox was in every movie he played, which made you want to fuck him. 
<laughs> True. <laughs> you know what I mean? Did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen Ralph it's... Macchio do that play snake. Uh, that would be lovely. Can I? But you know what is the most troubling to me is the fact that they have a driving partner. Uh, yeah. What's all that about? I don't yeah. Know. Yeah, we we I, I've been riding him all across the country. Have you now? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How, how are you paying him? <laughs> Ass, grass, or gas? <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow! But, but I just—it's uh, a classic example of why they should have left Snake as one of those characters because I'm thinking about it. I would have been completely disappointed probably with Vera on, on cheers. I would have been yes. completely disappointed with the mom on big bang theory. Mm -hmm. um, what's this with discussion? Maris on yeah. Frasier. So and Carlton, the doorman, which we did see a couple times in the show, but um, hidden like yeah, at the Halloween party when he's there the whole party, but he's wearing a gorilla mask the whole time. And you're like, you hear that voice, and, yeah. <laughs> so you still don't see what he looks like, but I think I wish they would have left Snake to our imagination because the way they built him up was not what they cast at all, mm -hmm. or what they wrote in this episode at all. He's fine. Yeah. He's fine. Yeah, exactly. Perfectly fine. And, you know, is is playing well with Mindy Cohn. I think they they pair up nicely. But you've said and, before you wanted a Scott Valentine. Yeah. Remember, that, remember Nick on Family Ties? Oh, yeah. If, if you don't remember him from that, I'm sure you would remember him from his hit sitcom, The Art of Being Nick. Would she? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he like kind but, of like a know, Judd Nelson from Breakfast Club type? Right, yeah, that right. type, but yeah. even less articulate though, more of a, hey, like literally th when they introduced him the first time it was like, well, Nick, this is my wife, Elise, hey. And uh, my sister, um, Tina Yothers and the, hey. <laughs> it's like, he was just, you know, pr presented as this inarticulate oaf. And I, I would have loved it. I would have loved it if Natalie had found herself a hot, dumb guy. Yeah. Damn, that would have been great. But anyway, uh, his character is also very important, Heather, because in the future, I don't know if you may have ever heard about this. There was a very controversial episode later this season called The First Time, where one of the girls loses her virginity. <gasps> and it is Natalie who loses it to Snake. Oh, wow. Yeah. It does not go the way Fast Times at Ridgemont High Thank does, God. thankfully. Thank God. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Anyhow, this has been the Robert Romanus podcast, guys. I've had a great time talking to you. And then, oh, no, 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 no. Facts of life. We've, we got to talk about that, that other thing that we're talking about. Okay. <sighs> okay. I will kick this off by saying I love a farce. Oh, I, I thought you were going to say I love a fart. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I was a big fan of Three's Company. People do not realize how good for, for what a goofy show it was. Three's Company was every single week, they did a farce yeah. with misunderstandings, with uh, uh, mis misidentified people, with you know slamming in and out of doors, thinking that person's fucking that person when they're not. Um, so I watched this episode the first time through and I really... I, I don't hate this episode. I need to start by saying that. I was not hating on this. And then I watched it the second time and I was like, oh, they they work, they, they go to some painful mechanisms to set this farcical moment in motion. And then it doesn't really sustain itself. It's It's a funny moment and then it's over. And what I'm talking about is setting up that Casey, Paul Provenza, who works with Joe at the center, is supposed to be meeting Blair at some formal thing, and he ends up showing up at the house. Right at the same time, Tootie has a date with a dude, and he's there to pick her up, and then Jeff, Tootie's boyfriend, shows up. So Blair quickly runs over to the other guy and pretends that he's her date. 
leaving Joe to have to say to Casey, well, sweetheart, and they're just co-workers and there's nothing romantic there. So this whole thing of I need to lie to you. OK, we're all going to leave now. Ha 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 ha. Bye. And Tootie and Jeff are left alone. And first line out of Jeff's mouth is that guy, Matt, was your date, wasn't he? So on the one hand, good that Jeff is not a complete idiot that actually thought all this was real. Well, it's not like he's illiterate, David. Oh, no, not he's not literate anymore. Yeah, David, it didn't work because of the sitcom lying. Oh. That's what if if the if I were the director, I would have said, I need you all. We all know watching that whose date is whose. I need you all to play this as if it, you are serious as a heart attack. Don't go over there and be like, yeah, yeah, it, Matt is it's my date. Yeah, that's it. Go over there and be like, well, <laughs> Matt, thank you for coming. I'm so excited for our date. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and yeah. play it straightforward. It would have worked better and been funnier. You're welcome, writers. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> if I have to teach you comedy. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's got a great point there. Because then, because the audience is already in on the joke. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I think that's that's a very good observation. And it was funny the moment when Blair sidling up to Matt and say, yeah, you know, but yeah, and this sort of, I'm providing you information very wide eyed. And of course, Matt, you know, Tootie and her boyfriend, Jeff. And he says, yeah, oh yeah, Tootie, I've heard so much about you from Blair. Blair, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know Blair's name, which is pretty fucking funny. Um, but yeah, oh, we got to talk about him. We got to talk about this actor that plays Matt. I promise it will be brief this time. We're not going to go all Robert Romanus on him. But Matt is played by Clarence Gilliard Jr. He would go on to be quite famous. Did you recognize him from anything, Heather? No. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matthew and I previously saw him on an early episode of Different Strokes oh. from 1981. Okay. If that isn't famous, I don't know what Boom. is. But I'm going to read this because it encapsulates everything, and this is cut and pasted from Wikipedia, okay? Oh, so it's true. Gilliard is known for his roles as second private investigator and right-hand man Conrad McMasters to Ben Matlock, played by Andy Griffith on the legal drama series Matlock. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. He played Cordell Walker's partner, James Jimmy Trevette, in the 1990s crime drama Walker, Texas Ranger with Chuck Norris and... He was Theo, the terrorist computer expert in Die Hard. Ooh, the guy oh. in the van with the glasses. Oh God, He's yes. in Die Hard. Dang it. Freaking love Die Hard. And he played Lieutenant Marcus Sundown Williams in Top Gun. <gasps> he was in Top Gun, the, the first one. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. So he, he goes on to some pretty high profile Pro projects here and uh the thing we've also mentioned when we've talked about him before heather is matthew and i are friends with the costume designer for these final seasons she wrote a memoir they reached out to they found the podcast reached out to us and i got to interview her so oh we know we're, we're close personal friends with diana eden the costumer okay she teaches at the university of nevada las vegas campus she teaches costume design Clarence Gilliard Jr. is a member of the film and theater acting faculty. He is? Yeah. At UNLV? UNLV, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, she costumed him in this 35 years ago. And uh, as of present day, they are both faculty members uh, at, this, at this school. How cool Mommy, is that? You're a stranger who's come here, come from another town. Small world, isn't it? But, oh, am I not muted? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, keep going. I could listen to you sing Beautiful. for hours, Matthew. I stopped listening when we stopped talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> but speaking of Diana Eden, Blair in that dress. Oh, holy Stunning. cabooses. Oh, oh, the formal? And oh, my that God. motherfucker, that looked like a mink that she had. Oh, because you did know. you see how soft that thing was? 
that was mm-hmm. like it was it was being blown around in the scene. She laid it on the table and there was like a fan on it or something or an air conditioning vent. It started moving and I was like, oh, my God, Becky, <laughs> <laughs> that was a fucking fur. Oh, God yeah. damn it. Yeah, Blair looked like she did not look like a million dollars. She looked like ten million dollars. Yeah, in that dress, and mm. uh, yeah, and Paul Provenza, no slouch in in the tuxedo. He looked lovely too. Could have used the haircut. Not gonna lie. No, nope. uh, <laughs> don't you dare cut that fucking head of hair. No, just just clean it up a little, shape it, give nope. it a little more more shape, a little more no nope. nope. texture. He was giving me like a little Rex Smith. Okay. I could give you that. Totally. And Rex Smith. God, tr- how fuckable was he? You trim up his sides with that hair, David. You know what you're going to get? You're going to get Justin Timberlake in 1999. Oh, geez. Short yeah. on the sides and curly on top. No, thank you. Or no. Joe from this episode. <laughs> Heather, uh, as a heterosexual woman. Yes. What did you think? Like, as a kid... Would you have looked at Paul Provenza and been like, yes, but like, what did you think of him now? I thought he was very handsome in this, w- w- watching it yesterday. Okay, that's what I needed to hear. I thought he cleaned up well, mm. you know. Can we talk about how visible his bulge was in the kitchen, even in dark jeans? Mm. Oh, <laughs> it was in the same place. It was he, in he dresses his to the right, episode. kids. Oh, my Lord, Becky, Paul Provenza. And Sally was correct when she said it is electric between him and Blair. He was looking at her over that coffee like he was looking into her soul. Oh, I I agree. This the the Paul and Blair, the Casey and Blair thing, which will continue to evolve. They will eventually actually see each other for realsies in a few weeks. Um, but that's one good thing this episode did was uh, continue to advance that. And like you said, Matthew, to keep building in that, oh, there's something here. And Blair talks like she thinks he's annoying. And doesn't she explicitly even say you're the most annoying person I've met since Joe? Because yeah. he's basically the male version of Joe. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. You see, they added him to the show, Heather and we have no problem with it. We're like, yeah, because he's got some function there. This Pippa bitch. I'm glad you didn't have to see her. That's all. That's all I got to well, say. Well, we needed some real testosterone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we- since George Clooney left. <gasps> oh, there, there was a bulge that needed to be filled. Mm, true. Woo! Yep. Um, oh, and before they go out, speaking of costuming, Joe uh, is dressed in a pink T-shirt and a light gray gauze jacket like a miami vice thing with the shoulder pads and i think she's got the sleeves rolled up and matthew and i always talk about this is when she's about to go do her tight tan at the laugh hole this is such a stand-up <laughs> comedy she looks like you know paula poundstone or ellen degeneres yes. or jerry seinfeld for that matter they all dress the same tight tan. <laughs> but yeah joe we haven't seen joe in a, a stand-up like outfit in a while and so this was it was kind of nice to be back there um, what else do we want to talk about, kids? What else is uh, what else is happening here? What else is of note? Well, did anyone have a problem with the very ending? A um, little bit. I mean, am I bit. getting ahead of us? We have these weird, outdated ideas about men and women and what dating is and what just enjoying an evening with someone of the opposite sex is. And it's so bizarre that Jeff and Tootie are, you know, long distance relationship. And Tootie is upset that Jeff has been canceling a lot of things. And Tootie has this super nice guy, Matt. And when she says she can't go out with him, like go out, go out with him, because she's seeing somebody, Matt is such a nice guy. He just says, oh, well, tell him he's a lucky guy it's like oh we love Matt. he's yeah. so so nice and non-toxic and not you would not see that on the bachelorette these days you do not know but the thing is like when tootie does say okay jeff has 
it has ditched me again. I want to go to this super important winter carnival. So she goes with Matt. I don't think that it was, okay, Matt, I'm going to go to the winter carnival with you. And this will initiate a long-term monogamous dating process that will eventually lead to sexual activity and marriage. And, you know, that I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. And then Jeff comes in and realizing that she was supposed to go up. He's like, how could you do this to me? And it's like, wait, wh what? I talked about this when I was on uh, another podcast talking about Pretty in Pink. The whole, should Molly Ringwald go to the prom? Should she not? It's like, you know, you could have just gone with John Cryer as friends. You could have planned that from minute one and none of the angst of the film would have had to happen. But anyway, uh, I'm, cl I'm, I'm very curious to hear your spin on that element of it, Heather, as, as a female of the 21st century. Wait, what's the official question? I have no <gasps> fucking clue. How do you feel about that question? I just asked you. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, do you think it's okay? I guess I do need to form it into a question. Were you disturbed by how black and white uh, things were when it came to social dating, dating people? That, you know, Judy and Jeff were, they definitely are serious. But Blair yeah. asking her, well, have you ever officially told him that you're officially not going to see anybody else? And that whole thing. I don't know. Just to, do, do you have any thoughts on that situation? The idea of was Tootie wrong to go out with Matt? There. there here's the oh question. Oh, my God. We landed ah, the plane. I got it. Holy I found God. it. Yes. Oh my God, pilot Beverly Ann over here landed that plane. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus H. Christ, you're not getting paid uh, by the word, Chuck Dickens. Oh uh, my God. I'm Howard Cosell word salad today. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, Was she wrong to go out with him? Yes. Well, are you saying yes or are you saying no, yes? That's I'm the saying question. yes, that is the question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't know the entire Jeff and Tootie history. Mm, okay. Is it lengthy? Is it long? Uh, yeah. They they dated a couple of years ago when they were both in high school. And then when he went off to college, they kind of grew apart and they broke up for a couple of years. But they've uh, rekindled their relationship uh, this previous Valentine's Day. So it's been ah. not quite a year. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, but now it's, it's the winter carnival. So some time has passed it's November now. So we're we're approaching a yeah. year. Yeah. OK, well, I'm very single. So who the hell am I to know anything? <laughs> but um, but I guess if I were Tootie, I would feel the same, even though it is sort of awkward to like have that conversation of officialness with someone mm -hmm. if you're not sure that they feel the same way as you. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like. I mean, I, I get her. I get her. You know, yeah. I think Blair was a little pot stir, you know, with the whole, oh, are you official or are you official or whatever it was? Yeah. And then yeah. the whole the whole little um, clever little line about, you know, men don't know what we don't tell them when we don't want them to know something or something <laughs> yes. like that. Right? <laughs> yes, that and is like, a true Blair Warnerism right there. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, it's true in real life, isn't it, Matthew? <laughs> I haven't um, had a conversation like that with the man. Oh, my goodness. Since some, oh, my, my dear Clinton administration. See. Yeah, I was going to say. But I also <laughs> went the extra mile um, and found out that Penn State is a five hour drive from oh, to yeah. Hill, New York. So, mm -hmm. I mean, mm, you, you can't really expect somebody to pop over for the weekend. You know what I mean? A five hour drive. And so, I don't know. I felt like Tootie had every right to ask another guy out. I just hated when he said, I'm leaving. And she went, Jeff, and just stood there. Oh, I thought of you. 
<laughs> I know you hate when they do that. That's uh, you are allowed to open the door, duty, and finish this conversation. <laughs> it was just <laughs> no, don't go. Mm. <laughs> so true. So fucking uh, true. Open that door and be like, I ain't done yelling at you yet. Okay, mm-hmm. but I'm I'm somebody that wants to get it all out and have that fight, not cross my arms like a ten year old. Anyway, but I'm not here to critique Kim Fields' acting choices. No, that was probably directorial because she would have yes. had to step out of her light. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I here's here here's what I am thinking. I, I agree that she should have had the opportunity to go out with this Matt dude. And like all, you know, every episode of Three's Company, you're like, oh, they had just told him. If Jack had just told Chrissy, I feel as though if Tootie had said to Jeff, okay, well, since you're not able to be here again, I do want to go to the Winter Carnival. A guy has asked me, I would like to say yes, but I only consider him a friend. The idea that, you know, Jeff, FYI, I am going to have male friends and I'm going to want to do things with them. I still feel like Jeff probably would have been like, nope, nah, that's a dude trying to move in on my turf. But yeah, uh, I at least. Well, there's no time for that scene, though, David. I I love the sentiment, but we're too busy making a life size map of the United States with a magnetic (laughs) truck on it so that Natalie can have a few words in this episode. Yeah. They spent five whole minutes decoupaging that truck onto the pre-made magnet. It was so, uh, yeah. Which uh, is very big. The truck is way too big, by the way. Big truck. Big truck. Anyway. Uh, anyway. That way they only had to move it like every four hours, though. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> exactly. Well, what are they going to do? Have a have a tiny little truck and like move it every, okay, he's, he's probably going 55 right about now. <laughs> And I did look, stand here. Way, I did look, by the way, I-80 is the actual map that they had lined out. That was, oh, that, that, that was correct. <laughs> oh, Matthew, I'm, I'm so proud of you. I didn't even do that. Wow. Yeah, I'm a regular Magellan over here. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting and very on brand that Blair was the one coaxing Tootie into not tying herself down and it is a little bit girl power you do got to credit this where she's like she doesn't say it in so many words but there is the the sense of uh he's off living his life doing what he wants leaving you behind why should you miss things that you want to do just because of a man when there are other men who are interested in taking you to these things yeah if it's just a carnival though why is everyone so hell-bent on having a date because it's the winter carnival, Heather. Well, it's not like a winter formal. It's a carnival. <laughs> like I could go on a fucking Ferris wheel by myself, for God's sakes. It's the most important event. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Heather. I don't really want a guy watching me eat a foot long corn dog and then a pulled pork sandwich and then an yeah. elephant ear, for God's sake. Elephant ear. I don't want a, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't want a, I don't want a man watching me watch all that. And then the caramel <laughs> apple and then the fried, the awesome blossom. Yeah. And I especially don't want him to come home with me and watch me shit it out. No, there's not going to be any, you know, hanky panky no, after all that. No, I'm, I'm going to leave. How bloated I'm going to be? I'm going to give you a kiss on the cheek at the door, and I'm about to blow this bitch up. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. Was that a fart? My fault, I fear. Uh, I'm picturing Blair in her mink eating spare ribs out of like a paper tray with the red gingham pattern on it. Yeah, I I agree. It's the the winter carnival being so fucking important and, you know, being so Tootie is in this shiny royal blue like she is. That is dressy. Blair, we know, is going. Blair is actually dressed up for going with Casey to the fundraiser to try and scare up some money for the shelter, which honestly, I wish that had been the episode. That could have been a much more interesting thing with Blair trying to, you know, this uncouth guy. He even says, I don't like hanging around those rich people. It makes me nervous. 
you know, her trying to navigate this with him on her arm. What a what an interesting thing that could have been in the in the hands of a completely different room full of writers. Yes. Or three theme park actors that, you know, mm-hmm. were, know everything and know it better. And, and one Emmy Award recipient. Yes. <laughs> so humble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I've got no other notes, kids. I've got, I've just got a summary for this. Heather, do, I don't have, do you, do I, are we, am I wrong? Like, I feel like we covered all of the things, didn't we? Yeah, the, it's fine. I think the only thing I was bothered by was how quickly um, the guy was fine. Like at first he was so mad and stormed out when he found out about Tootie and the other guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jeff. And then at the end, he's like, he saw the guy in his pajamas at Tootie's house when he wasn't there and he's suddenly fine with it. And he's going to propose like, what the hell? Yeah. 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 I, I agree. The The only last thing that I have in my notes is just talking about this sweaty setup of there being uh, some type of a pajama party at uh, a frat house. And it's a way to get Beverly Ann out of the house. And she's there because Oliver, who has been her boyfriend, whom we've heard about but haven't seen since last season and will not see again. So we get them out of the house in their pajamas. And then Matt shows up just to say to Tootie, I, I don't even remember what the fuck he, why, what his reason was, but he's there. But she's like, oh, you're stopping by here before you go to that party. Well, um, Let's let's have a drink before you go in Coco. They always have Coco at this house. Do they? Every, they always yes. Every time they say let's have a come in, I'll stop in. Let's I'll fix you a cup of Coco. They always have co- not coffee. No one says have a cup of coffee or, or a, even a cup of tea or a soda. You want a soda? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Tang or whatever. It's like just <laughs> let me Coco. see what we've got. Mm, purple stuff. Ooh, Sunny D. so when jeff then shows up right after we see matt go into the kitchen it's like oh lord we have another little farcical potential here but their argument ends up culminating in with uh wait a minute i did write this down it ends up culminating stop (laughs) their their argument builds up to uh she says i give up this is impossible and he says you're darn right it is and she says oh really well then maybe we should call the whole thing off and just be friends and he says i don't want to be friends and tootie says then what do you want and he says i want you to marry me yeah wow so and tootie is understandably taken aback like what like do you really mean that? I, I like this moment. This moment was played as far as the shock of it. It did kind of come out of left field and all that. But yeah, Tootie says, you know, she she says, you want to marry me? And he lovely says, you do have to know this is going to mean you're, you can't see other guys. <laughs> Just a funny line. And then she says, you drive a hard bargain and they kiss. And he says, I hope this is a yes. And they're just kissing. And it's like this. Oh, my God. We did. Tootie was the baby of the show, Heather. Mm. She was nine. The first time we saw her play this role, she was nine years old. Dang. And she's engaged now. And at that moment, in comes Clarence, in comes Matt, Clarence Gilliard, with the Cocos in his pajamas. And he does a perfect physical as soon as he sees it he half ducks down and tries to tippy toe out and turn and get out of the room unseen big laugh i actually really really did appreciate that and he played it perfectly and and you're right and then all jeff says tootie goes there's an explanation and jeff says nope none needed i didn't see the guy in his pajamas okay Now, Heather, to your point. Yes. About going from broken up to engaged. I had to sit with that for a moment. And then I had to say, okay. And let me tell you why. Because one of the wonderful sitcoms of the 80s, The Golden Girls. 
you may remember one of the greatest series of all time. I remember that show. I've heard of it. Yes. Final episode of that series. We introduce a brand new character in Leslie Nielsen, a brand new character to the show. And by the end of that hour, Dorothy and him are married. And the show ends. So in typical 80s sitcom fashion, this is all perfectly acceptable. It's all completely understandable and palatable. And I, it, it raised my, my, my score for this episode. Wow. Because okay. it's just an 80s sitcom. And yep, that happens. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah. I didn't have a problem with that either. And, and this is not a character who was just introduced to us. We met Jeff so many years ago, yeah. back in, I think it was season five. He's the only met. consistent boyfriend we've had from oh, okay. for this long. I yeah. mean, well, for I any like of the that. girls. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, for that reason too, I was like, well, yeah, why the, why the heck not? Let's go there. The girls are aging and getting older. And the idea that Tootie, the baby is the first one to get engaged. She won't be the first to get married, but uh, it's, yeah. Is Natalie, cause she had the sex? It is Joe who gets married to a man, to, to, to a man. To I a need man. to make sure to qualify that. Um, but when Natalie, after Natalie sleeps with Snake, I'm just going to spoiler alert here, uh, then Snake doesn't call her. And she's like, oh, fuck. Like, I should not have given him my purity because now he's not going to call. Now he doesn't respect me. He whatever just used yeah. me and all that. And then finally, when he does contact her, he's like, it's because I've been thinking so much. I, I couldn't call you because I've just been so thinking about it so much. She's <laughs> like, well, whatever. I don't care if you want to break up, you want to break up. And he's like, well, no, I've been thinking about wanting to spend the rest of my life with you. Oh. So apparently she was good the first time. Hmm. I guess. And yeah. So uh, not in formal, like formal proposal. Are Natalie and Snake engaged at the end of the series? But um, kind of implied, an implied engagement. And then we have Tootie and Jeff who are formally engaged by that time. And, uh, yeah, and Joe is married. Hmm. And yeah. And at the wedding, Blair's date is Casey. So Blair and Casey are are still a, a potential thing. And uh, yeah. Any last thoughts, Heather? No, I guess in current times, if someone's ripping apart an 80s sitcom, they're going to say, uh, you know, like a very feminist thing would be uh, Tootie should marry him because he just basically wants to get her to marry him so that he can control her and she can't date anybody. Ooh. Oh, wow. I hadn't thought of it that way. Well, damn. Okay. That, that is, that is, well, I can't just, argue you know, against you know, that. Like if, you, if you think about the ongoings of the last five or 10 years around here and you listen to that dialogue. Yeah. And you're like, whoa. Yeah. Ma yeah. You know, get, get a, get a 22 year old on the show and see what they have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the words toxic masculinity would be thrown around more than <laughs> once. Any last thoughts, Matthew, before we go? No, nope. loved it, loved it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 80s uh, sitcom-tastic, and it's okay. Yeah, I wasn't mad at it. I was able to, to feed into some of the whimsy, like I said, the farcical stuff. I almost wish that had been taken a little bit further. But uh, in the end, I am, I am a little bit of a sucker for a romantic comedy. And the fact that this ends with an engagement and with it being our, our little tootie, I'm... I'm uh, not mad at all at this episode, which is not something I thought I'd ever hear myself say about a season nine show. So there. And my final thought is I would not want to be proposed to in the middle of a freaking fight. Okay. No. That could probably also be why I'm single. Uh oh. <laughs> well, and he's been out walking all day. Pick up a ring if that's where it's going. He doesn't have a ring. Yeah, do it right. At all. 
He yeah, or he could have still had. Remember, he had his his football ring, whatever that was, that Tootie wore on the necklace around her neck. And when they broke up the first time, she came back the ring. That would have been cool if they brought that back, Aww. and have him say, you know, here's here's the ring. She's like, your your football, your high school football ring. He's like, yeah, but I want you to wear it on your finger now. Yeah. Before, until yeah. I can get you a real diamond, of course. Yeah. Until I can get you a real one. <laughs> That would have been sweet. He could have he said he could have proposed with a pearl ring saying, I as a marine biologist, I dove to the bottom of the ocean for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, I think that's wrapped us up for this week. So Heather, if you will sit there uncomfortably while I give the outro to this uh, episode here. Uh, next week, we're going to be watching season nine, episode eight, A Rose by Any Other Age, which had an original air date of November 28th, 1987. You can watch the episode ahead of time for free at dailymotion.com. I will post the link in the show notes and on this episode's webpage. That is all for now. Thank you, Heather Delmott, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I miss you guys. This is oh. fun. I miss you too. Wow, I can't wait till I get to see you again in person for realsies. Me too. Yeah. Another another holiday baking party. Cookie time's coming. We got to do it. Cookies, man. We got to do it. So anyhow, that is all for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And remember. The facts of life are all about. Oh, snake. <laughs> <laughs> Disappointed. Let's Face the Facts was created, produced, written, hosted, and edited by the wonderful David Almeida. Our theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Please visit facethefactspod.com for supplemental photos and videos, links to social media, and ways that you can support the show. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This is Matthew Arder saying tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts. <laughs> <laughs>